element comes out. And so what, what we know is the violent element and the, and the anarchist, um, these organized groups uh, that, are, that are infiltrating with the Molotov cocktails, we've been hearing a lot more details and doing our research on what's going on. So they're, they're parking cars at strategic points around the city. They're putting bricks out at almost like construction sites at strategic points in the city. They're using um, protesters to create violence. A few, like let's say they're on, let's say there are stores on 14th Street. Then on 12th Street, the pro, the protesters will suddenly get really violent. The police will all, or they'll fire shots in the air. The police will swarm to 12th Street. But then the looters and the anarchists will start looting and creating uh, violence on 14th Street. And then they have their cars parked right there. So as soon as the cops who are on 12th Street start moving to 14th Street, they're gone. So that's specifically the tactics of some of these people. And it's very smart. The police have actually been, from what, again, we've done a deep dive, stuff I can't even put on the podcast, but from what we've seen, um, I mean, from what we've heard, the police are even really impressed with the organized criminal behavior that's happening. And again, on the looter side, there's gangs who have basically divided up the city to, to you know, depending on where the protests are. So there's in Brooklyn, they're in Manhattan, they're in the Bronx, and so on. And then on the anarchist side, even when I asked Eric Adams, who are these people, he couldn't tell, he didn't know. But we do know, you know, they'll track it down because, or somebody knows, because they know this woman with the Molotov cocktails, they know other people. But here's what we found out that's really interesting, is that a lot of the protesters, particularly at night, and these are protesters who have been there every single day for the past five, six, seven, eight, nine days now, are actually undercover police officers. So they're in the front of the protest, they're in the back of the protest, they're in the middle of the protest. They, they are yelling and shouting just like everyone else. They've, they're, and they're not trying to stop the protests at all. They're just trying to root out the people who seem to be a little bit more violent. And the way they can identify them, often the ones who are more violent, have, have, they don't, they're not just wearing face masks, but they're wearing masks completely covering their face so you can't identify them. And also you can't even tell what ethnicity they are, or are they white, or are they black, you don't know. But the undercover cops that are in here, they have nothing against the peaceful protesters. That's encouraged peaceful protesting. But they are quickly identifying and getting rid of the more violent or even kind of organized chaotic elements of this. And I do think we've probably passed the peak of that violence. I do think lawmakers, I think it's clear to the peaceful protesters that lawmakers are listening to what they have to say. Lawmakers are, are walking in every city. Lawmakers are walking with these people and listening. And the best you could do is listen. And I do think at the same time, there's uh, the anarchists are being identified and will be taken to task. And if again, if you look at like Project Veritas, they have some videos of that. I'm going to try to get that guy in the podcast. Um, uh, let me see. I, I do want to say something though. Sure. I think a lot of this is really started with uh, with parents. I mean, if you think about it, uh, kids, you you know, parents need to teach their kids that you know everyone is is should be treated equal. Everyone, you know, it 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 really does stem from parents. Um, uh, if you're prejudiced, if you if if you're racist, if you're anything, so I mean. A lot of this is rooted with bad parenting, and I, I feel like this is a really great moment that if you are a parent, that you engage with your kids now, even when they're young, little. Let them see, because this is part of life. And if you go with them, I mean, our daughter's 18, I'm gonna be going with her, I'm gonna be talking to her, I'm gonna be explaining everything to her, um, even though she probably doesn't wanna listen to what I have to say, but they do listen, even at this age. But it's important, I mean, take your kids, if, you know, during the day, let them see this, but teach them the proper way to do it. You know, this is part of our right to protest, but it is not right to do the things that they do at night, you know, and, and, and to be in illegal um, things. I mean, right. you, you just have to be a good parent. Right, and so so that's a good point, and I, uh... I love well-being on Instagram here made also a good point that uh, first the parents need to learn that everyone was born and created equal. Yeah. And I don't think, I don't really know anyone, 
I mean, yes, we have seen an incredible instance, horrifying instance of racism with the murder of George Floyd. And we know that's not an isolated incident. So we know that there is racism. But my assumption is everybody, really the majority of America, if not more, realize that there's racism exists and that these things are, are horrible. And so that's why it's good to, I think the conversation that the kids need to have is not just that everyone is created equal, but that protests do not have to lead to violent riots. Like I think my first concern when Lily came to us and said she wanted to go on a protest was that the protests are adding fuel to the violent riots. And, but I do, at the same time, I do think it's really important the protesters get their message heard. And, and I think it's important that the police root out these parts of society that are trying to bring down mm -hmm. society. So I will answer, or we'll both answer some questions about business ideas, the economy, what's gonna happen next. But I just want everybody to know that I, just from all the conversations we've had, things are going to calm down, even though it feels even a little scarier, I would say, than the coronavirus lockdown. So the protests have become more peaceful, and I think that's in part because the protesters are feeling heard. And I think it's also because of law enforcement has backed off kind of violently trying to stop the protesters because they realize it's not the protesters that are causing a lot of the problem. That's why we have these curfews. That's why some police officers are undercover. That's why they're trying to identify the people in more dangerous, either gangs or more organized organizations. And you know, everybody's concerned about this and everybody should have a voice, whether you put I don't know, you know, whether you put the black square on Instagram to, I feel like a lot of that was what's called virtue signaling. People who, you know, just want to, don't want anybody to think bad about them are putting that. But I think everybody should put a voice where they think they can be heard. So. And actions with everything you do, not just one day, not just, uh, you know, the Tuesday blackout Tuesday, but do right. it every day. And look, I, and I think it even goes to the highest level. So both Donald Trump and Joe Biden like Joe Biden, you know, a week and a half ago was saying to uh, Charlemagne, the radio host, like he wouldn't answer Charlemagne's questions, but he said, you, if you don't vote for me, you know, you're, you're, you're probably, he implied you'd, you'd be, you weren't black. And he was saying that to Charlemagne, who of course is, and he's, Charlemagne's got 10 million listeners. So it wasn't really accurate. And then Trump, I think his symbolic posing with the Bible doesn't really do much to show that he's listening to the protesters. Now, I know he's been saying that the murder of Joy, George Floyd was uh, horrific and should be prosecuted, but the news doesn't report that. But I do think maybe he, I think somebody should, should start to address real reform. And so I actually took the liberty, not that anyone's gonna pay attention to me, but I took the liberty of writing to Trump through connections I have that I know it, it gets to him. And I think there are several areas where he could quickly announce, or governors could announce, or mayors could announce, they're looking at these systematic ways to reform the system, because there is, in fact, I, don't, I, I hate to call it systemic racism, but you look at many parts of our society, and you, you look at what the origins of those parts of society are, and you say, oh, okay, I didn't know that. Well, like, for instance, when you go to a restaurant, how do you pay the waiter or the waitress? You tip them, and so restaurant owners are, allowed to not pay waiters as much money because they know they're gonna make part of their income from tipping. Well, that started off in the 1800s, right after slavery was abolished. It started off that uh, railroad owners didn't wanna pay the porters who were helping the passengers, didn't wanna pay them so much money, so they allowed for tipping, and that's how tipping started, was essentially a, a somewhat racist policy to, pl to pay uh, black employees of railroads less money. So, you know, there are things that we don't know about, you know, in, in society, and that's just one of like a hundred that I could list. Which, which, which explains why tipping is really mostly just done in the U.S. and not in other countries. Yeah, and the other, when we're in other countries, you're actually discouraged from tipping. Right. So, so it's sort of like an insult to them. Yeah, and so, uh, you know, one area I think it's really, the most important reforms you can make right now, in addition to law enforcement, and again, this is I'll only talk for a few minutes about this and then we'll get into some other stuff. But the most important reforms you can make other than law enforcement is people wanna move out of poverty. So, 
you know, right now, before the pandemic started, African Americans had their lowest unemployment rate ever, which sounds good until you realize it was still double the white unemployment rate. And a lot of it is, this is gonna sound almost un weird, but a lot of it is because of uh, licensing. So in California, you, 177 different occupations, you need licensing. You need a license, you need to get to, to take courses and then pay the state of California money if you wanna be a data entry operator at a job. Why would, yeah. why would you need to do that? So that doesn't affect me, right? I don't, cause I'm not going for a data entry job. So it probably doesn't affect you either. But for people who live in the projects and maybe a girl who's 18 years old, raising two, three kids, mm -hmm. single mother, how is she gonna go to school for 10 months and then pay a, a license fee to the state of California? She can't. So she has to stay in poverty instead of just getting a job that can help her raise her family. So. And why does Cal the average state, 92 occupations require licensing? Why does California have 177? Why does New York have over 100? Like these are regressive taxes against not just minorities, but anybody in the bottom one third of society. Like what's happening now is, yes, it's a racial protest, but it's also class protests. People can't get out of poverty because of these innocent laws that it seems like they're doing good, oh, they're giving the states money, but they're actually regressive against the bottom third of society. They're not regressive against you, and they're not regressive against us, they're regressive against, if, if, you, if you're an African-American woman, and you've been braiding your friend's hair all your life, and now you wanna charge $5 for it, well, you've gotta go to school for a year, and then pay a fee, and what, in order to charge $5 to braid your friend's hair. It's just not fair, you have to, Pay a license if you want to mow someone's lawn. It's not fair. So let's look into kind of job reform that's related to that. Let's look into law enforcement reform. Right now, if you're within 21 feet of a police officer and they say, put up your hands, and you don't put up your hands, the police officer is obligated to use some sort of physical force against you. Like these laws give, give people like Chauvin, the police officer, uh, the right to do whatever they want, it's unfair. So give them better tools for dealing with people who, who don't automatically obey their commands. And that doesn't affect just African Americans. 60% of the people who are uh, uh, unfairly treated by the police are mentally ill. And a lot of, there's a big overlap there with the homeless African American community. But, you know, this affects, you know, Everybody, again, this becomes a class war. It affects the bottom one third or one fourth or one fifth of society. So what are the standard operating procedures for police officers if someone resists arrest within 21 feet? Right now, it's probably not good. Uh, what are the procedures for vetting police officers? Like this officer had had problems in the past. Why wasn't he immediately fired or something done to him? So that needs reform. Uh, obviously we need prison reform. Why, why for the same laws being broken are more minorities put in jail than white people? That needs to be looked at and immediately reformed. For instance, we know, we all, you guys and I, we all know that marijuana is gonna be legal across the country. Let's just release, and marijuana, usage of marijuana was a nonviolent crime. Let's release everybody who's in prison for nonviolent crimes. And let's, by the way, not make them felonies that require prison sentences. Marijuana we know is gonna be legal. Probably every other drug's gonna be legal. You know, why were there crack laws that were much more uh, uh, strict than cocaine laws when African-Americans were known to use crack and more wealthier white people were using cocaine? Like all of these things, need to be looked at, uh, uh, you know, banking reform. So, so, you know, as hard as it is to believe or understand, you know, 14% of African-Americans do not have a bank account. Four, only 4% 4 of white people have bank accounts. So why is that? How about- Wait, 4%? Of white people don't have a bank oh, account. okay. Sorry. I was like, and, wow, really? 14% of African-Americans don't have a banking account. So what does that mean? It means if an African-American 
wants to borrow money, they've got to go to a pawn shop or a payday lender. Mm-hmm. So a payday lender lends you money based on your paycheck that might be coming tomorrow or the next day. And a pawn shop takes your item and lends you out at like 100% interest rates as opposed to you and me could get a, a credit card that has like almost no interest rate. Why do you think they don't have, I mean, why do you think that they don't have uh... Well, because in, in, for many banks, there's a minimum and they don't have the minimum to, or they get charged. They don't want to get charged. So if you have a minimum of like $500 to open up a bank account, but and you'll get charged twenty dollars a month with six, you know, whatever that is a year, two hundred forty dollars a year. You don't want to open up a bank account. Right. So and there's all sorts of other little fees and services, and it's it's intimidating then mm. to figure it out. And maybe they don't have a home, or you know, right. maybe they're hopping around from home to home, so they don't have an address, and they don't want to put an address down. Right. So the, who knows? I don't know what the reason is, but what we do know is. There's companies like Square. So Jim McKelvey has been on my podcast, the co-founder of Square. Mm -hmm. There are companies like Venmo owned by PayPal where anyone could set up a Square account or a Venmo account. And in fact, Square was made a quasi bank during the stimulus period to help get stimulus checks to the unbanked. Let's institutionalize that and allow the unbanked to set up at least a checking account with Square, maybe a basic savings account with Square or Venmo. Mm Or who knows what other company, maybe with the post office, like let's put the post office to good use because yeah, they're, they're not doing anything right now. So, huh. you know, so banking reform is important. Education reform is important. And why are, you know, with all of these student loans, it's, it's you know, yeah. the bottom one third of society and many of the people living in projects and so on can't go mm-hmm. to college without getting into enormous debt, which they're not going to be able to afford to pay back. Right. So, Which is making the divide even bigger and it's what we've talked about here on this podcast uh, earlier let's make online universities accredited yes. they're a lot cheaper and would solve a lot of the problems of education reform so people could get a law degree even without having to spend three hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars so anyway those are some examples of the reforms that i think politicians should be in front of and say look we're listening we've heard we're going to do reforms we're going to do prison reform law enforcement reform banking reform, education reform, economic reform, voting reform. You know, African-Americans make up 12% of American society, but only 6% of African-Americans are registered to vote. Well, why is that? It's because in some states, if you don't vote, then your, your right to vote is removed. So in other states, you could just move into the state and you're suddenly registered to vote. So we need to have voter re- voting reform that's consistent across the country that doesn't block people from voting. Mm-hmm. And that makes the difference in many elections. A lot of elections would be different if we already had voter reform. Maybe that's what the people currently in power, whether it's congressmen or senators or governors or presidents, maybe they're nervous about it. But I think if you help voters have more access to voting or potential voters have more access to voting, they'll vote for whoever gives them the power to vote. Mm-hmm. So... I mean, you look at like a great example, 1972, uh, 18 year olds were given the power to vote for the first time. Well, did they all vote for George McGovern, the Democrat, or did they vote for Richard Nixon? Well, Richard Nixon won 49 states in 1972 and then was almost impeached. He had to resign, you know, a year, a year and a half later. But uh, um, all right, we'll ask. uh, So, okay, what do you think about requiring voter ID for voting like they do in Georgia? I mean... You probably need, I don't know. I don't know the answers what voter reform would I mean, do. There's so much, yeah, I think you need to show who you are. Yeah, but not everybody has a driver's license and not everyone well, has have, an ID. Right, so it's just such a mess. But what we're suggesting is if somebody said, James, can you come up with all the solutions? To, you just listed 37 problems. If, can you come up with all the solutions, please, before you write to us? Then maybe I can think about that's this. The thing <laughs> is, like, more people need to put, put solutions you know, in the hat rather than problems, because that's all we hear. Right. We only hear problems. We only hear, oh, this is happening. This is happening. So stop giving, we all know it. So let's let's give solutions. But I do think a solution right now is for people in charge, our leaders to step forward and say, we've heard you, here are the reforms. We're going to immediately start. I mean, one thing we could do immediately is release all nonviolent prisoners. Instead, they've released everybody. No, they released murderers and people convicted of sex crimes uh, because they didn't want to get them to get coronavirus in jails, but they haven't just blanket released everybody who's in prison from 
nonviolent crimes. So that's one thing they can do immediately. They can they can get rid of like all the BS licensing. They can get rid of a lot of voter restrictions. So there are things they could do pretty quickly, or at least signal to the world that they're looking at these things. And instead, you have like a walk to the church. By the way, that church was almost destroyed by arson the mm -hmm. day before in Washington, D.C. I talked to somebody who's been in that church for 20 years, mm -hmm. and it's horrific. But everybody instead was just criticizing Trump for walking there with the Bible. And now okay. burning the church down. But okay, maybe they felt his action was too much about symbolism and not about change. So fine. Now I hopefully he'll do something that's more about change. Anyway, let's answer some questions. Jay... Where are we? Change, change, change. Um, all right. Is the prosperity of the U.S. in danger? Great question. Because everybody I talk to right now is afraid. They're afraid that is is this like some sort of Arab Spring or revolution that's going to change the dynamic of the U.S.? And the answer is no. Uh, uh, you know. Right now, there are 40 million people unemployed, but a lot of them are going to be rehired. You can't, you know, in order for the PPP loans to work for small businesses, they have to rehire people. Yes, there will be heavy unemployment. No, we're not going into a depression. There's trillions of dollars of stimulus. Was that stimulus spent in all the right places? No. We'll see what happens with stimulus part two, if that, if that even does happen. But, you know, I'm not a huge believer in trickle down economics here. Well, there's some of that, but there's also bottom up economics. More people will start um, getting loans if the interest rates are held low enough and on and on and on. So pro right now the U.S. has, U.S. households have about $330 trillion in assets. So most people don't know this. The U.S. as a country, house by house, add up all the wealth of the houses, the U.S. has $330 trillion in assets and U.S. household debt including the government debt, is about $120 trillion. So the U.S. is an incredibly wealthy country, an extra $200 trillion in assets over debts. So no, the prosperity of the U.S. is not in question, but there is a divide. On the one hand, you have Elon Musk shooting off a rocket, which is an incredible, it's the first rocket with, with Americans, the first U.S. rocket with U.S. citizens on it since 2011, so almost 10 years. That's one thing. But on the other hand, you have these protests and you have this murder of George Floyd. So there is a divide. There's a divide between the prosperous and the people who are protesting and want more. And I think that divide has to close and it will close. Um, it'll close more and more every year. You know, initially I was thinking like, why are we protesting this? Didn't, you know, is, are we still having the same problems that we had in 1992 with Rodney King? And the answer is no. I think more politicians, more leaders are willing to listen as long as it's not sidetracked by people who want revolution and who are trying to physically hurt people and then they throw the videos up on Twitter and Twitter does nothing about them. Uh, I do think the, the U.S. prosperity remains. Right now there are 124 drug trials going on for vaccines and drugs about coronavirus, 124. So that's real science and real prosperity. And on top of that, you have advances in, uh, you know, robotics, you have answers in uh, uh, solutions and in, in, in innovation and in clean energy. I mean, uh, you know, electric vehicles are going to be, a co I'm invested in an oil company, right? So, but I will say, I'm the first to say electric vehicles are going to take over uh, oil driven, gas driven vehicles pretty soon. And, uh, you know, there's, there's innovations in every area of society. There's also more opportunities than ever. Like my, my, one of my kids, one of our kids was telling us, uh, oh, she was going to get a job this summer. And I'm like, don't get a job. There's, there's, I sent you a list of 20 different side hustles. You can make like a great living from home and, uh, or from wherever you want. Go to, go to, Thailand and make a living as a prostitute. No, just kidding about that part. Uh, she shouldn't do that. Um, so there's more, there's more opportunity than ever. There's more innovation than ever. And the U.S. is s prosperous by hundreds of trillions of dollars over its debts. So never, never, ever worry about that. So I'm going to go to another question. 
Uh, and that question was from Simon Chag. Everybody has such complicated names. Simon Chag, all eagles. Um, next question is from uh, uh, Gordon. Uh, Gordon A N Y C T O uh, Gordon A N A N Y C L S. Oh, N Y C L S is the last. Gordon. Anyway, is N Y C safe and prosperous? Yes, for all the same reasons. Although slightly different, New York City's is hit. Like about fifty percent of the restaurants in New York City, my guess, they're already out of business. Many retail stores already out of business. Not even going to wait for the economy to open back up. Uh, no point. And with these protests, I think that it hit the nail on the head. Like I saw protesters trying to break into residential buildings. So it's a little scary in New York City. Now, New York City's been through this before. In the 1970s, New York City was almost bankrupt. Uh, most of the areas that people love and live in right now were terror zones, like 14th Street and 5th Avenue. People wouldn't believe it if I told them. But when I was a kid growing up, that whole street was worse than 42nd Street. It was all prostitutes and uh, drug dealers, drug addicts. I would walk down the street and people would, like I was like a 13 year old kid. People would try to sell me guns, women, drugs, knives. And you know, you the New York City's a lot better than it was, but it's gonna take a hit right now for the short term, much worse than 9-11. New York City will take a hit. If, uh, is New York City down and out for the count? No, because it is a really great city. There's a lot of co people come here for the culture. They come here for the restaurants. They come here for the business opportunities. But that's going to take a, a good year or two or more to fully come back. Don't give up on the city, but it's not like it's going to open up tomorrow and everyone's going to be throwing a big party and lighting a tree. Um, uh, can you, t uh, let's see. So what are the three sources of anger? I think I explained that, uh, uh, but it's Janine Merrill. I will, I will say the sources of anger are obviously what happened to George Floyd in Minneapolis. And it's not just him. He's not, look, I've been involved in, I helped uh, start a law enforcement related company, which makes the only non-lethal device out there. I won't get into how we started it. We started it after, um, during the 2016 protests where it was hashtag Black Lives Matter was trending and uh, we developed or we got an inventor to develop a, a, a very non-lethal device that many police departments are now using. Uh, so, but look, police brutality is still happening. It's still racist. That's one of the sources of anger. The other source of anger is these lockdowns and the systemic poverty that's happening to a lot of people. And then the third source of anger is this I guess Antifa, we don't really know, but some other organization that just wants to, that just hates America, wants to bring America down. This woman, I know what you're referring to now. This woman who was arrested with the Molotov cocktail, the woman who bailed her out, she is associated with organizations that are very anti-Israel and very much down with America. She happens to work for a white shoe law firm in Washington, D.C., but, you know, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of weird things happening right now, but I do think the main source of anger we should pay attention to are the peaceful protesters. Let the police worry about these other bad actors. And, you know, the leader should address what the protesters are, are addressing. Have I personally seen any looting destruction in New York City? Of course. I've been into the neighborhoods where there's been, where windows are shattered. We weren't there. Where there was looting. We, 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 no, but I've driven. Yeah, aftermath. I wasn't there at the time. But riding around the city on my electric bicycle, uh, uh, I've seen the aftermath and just across the street from us, all up and down the street, all these stores are boarded up. They were never boarded up before, now they're boarded up to prevent uh, uh, looting. So we see the effects of it, you can see it. Uh, 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 what do you think about all the uh, Navy SEAL and Stoicism? So I guess, the, so it's Robert Saint Louis, what do you think about stoicism? Must we become robots in order to succeed? And I think here's what stoicism is. Sto in, a, in a nutshell, so stoicism has become very popular lately. It's a, it's a Greek philosophy that dates back to um, about 400 BC uh, with people like Socrates and um, Seneca and Epictetus. And 
Marcus Aurelius, who was an emperor around 340 AD, was the, uh, a Stoic Greek Roman emperor, and he wrote an excellent uh, book, Meditations, uh, by Marcus Aurelius. And Stoicism, you can think of it as almost like a secular religion. It's a religion without a god, which I think a lot of people were looking for. And it basically, in a nutshell, says, don't try to control things you have no control over. So, uh, uh, all right, I'll answer that one. Jay, get that question. Hey, close. I'll ask that one another question. Uh, um, but Stoicism is this philosophy. You can't, you can't control the things you have no control over. So, uh, you know, I think when we, when the lockdowns and the pandemic began, there was a real big instinct is to find out knowledge, to get certainty, to not have uncertainty. Like what's going to happen to my family? Are we all going to die from the virus? What's going to happen during this lockdown? Are we never going to be allowed out again? What's going to happen to my job? What's going to happen to my bank account? What's going to happen to my, my future? And so there was a lot of fear and there was a lot of uncertainty. And Stoicism would say, we don't know, but lean into it, be comfortable with not knowing, which is very difficult to do, be comfortable with not knowing. And, and you know, whether it's, you know, we talked about uh, how you can up your dopamine, up your serotonin. In some cases, this is a very neuroscience, there are some very neuroscience methods to be, un- to be comfortable in the not knowing, in the land of not knowing. And, you know, do what you can during this time. So do what you can to help others feel hope and calm. Do what you can to research business opportunities for yourself and other opportunities. Do what you can to help your work and your colleagues still, you know, make money and make a living and make a livelihood during this time. Help others in your free time, whether it's volunteering or you could have done Zoom chats with the elderly. You could have, you know, there's plenty of ways. So stoicism is about doing what you can and living in that land of not knowing and being comfortable with it. One step further than Stoicism is a Greek philosophical school called the Cynics. And the Cynics are, take it to an extreme. They basically say nothing matters, so don't even think about anything relating to society. So the, sometimes the Cynics were called um, Stoics with, without the clothes because cynics often didn't wear clothes. They just didn't care. And there's a great story of a cynic, um, Di- Di- I don't know how to say his name, Diogenes. Alexander the Great sees Diogenes you know, um, lying by a, a, a river. So Alexander the Great stops and says, you know, oh, you know, great sage, great philosopher, ask for anything and I'll give it to you. And Di- Diogenes says, can you just move over? You're in, you're in the sun. You're, in, you're blocking my son. So that's a, a, a cynic story where you so little care about life and authority. Uh, you don't want to hurt authority, but you're just, you're not letting anything disturb you at all. I don't, I think that's overboard and stoicism is an interesting, I would recommend uh, Ryan Holiday's book, The Obstacle is the Enemy, as a good intro for stoicism. And also he has a book coming out in September. I will tell you September 20th, 2020, his book is coming out called Lives of the Stoics. I'm looking forward to, to reading that once I get it. Um, okay, hey Klaus, H-E-Y-C-L-O-S, says, laugh out loud, James, hypothetically speaking, if you were to loot a store, which store would you loot and why that one? Oh, you're, you're really trying to stir up trouble. Hey Klaus, you want me to start looting stores? What store would you loot? I wouldn't. Uh, let's just realistically let me think. Mm-mm. Is there any I'm store? Not, I don't she doesn't even want me to answer this. Um, so I'm not. I, don't worry. Don't, you got to trust me sometimes. I'm not going to say, oh, loot the flower store. No, but, but just the fact. Of, yeah. You know, you don't know who's listening. You don't know. I mean, do you. I mean, no, but you're, I'm, you're I'm like an example for people. I know, but I'm just, you know? I'm just trying to think. I want to put thought into it. I want to think, is there anything that would. Like, let's say a store had treated me unfairly. They're. They're really, I can't even think I of a situation. But... Yeah, I can't even think of a situation where I would want to loot a store. You know why? For several reasons. One is, I do think you have to draw the line in your ethics and values. And I draw the line at, you know, stealing and, and other things and cheating and murdering and whatever. But the other thing is, I don't even want anything. Like, I lived with just a carry-on bag 
from place to place. And I didn't even need that much money to live. When you all, I lived for two and a half years. I mean, I lived for two and a half years with just a carry-on bag with 15 items in it. And I could have lived for as low as probably $20 a day, maybe even cheaper. There were actually some times when I was living, there was one month or two months where I lived for almost $0. Like I would stay with friends instead of Airbnb and I didn't buy anything. I didn't buy any belongings. So I know, and I've been broke. I've been dead broke and I've bounced back and I've been dead broke many times, not just once, not just twice, not just three times. And I've come back and I know you've been in extreme circumstances like living in Africa, living in China, when you came to New York after your husband died and you didn't really have anything, a leg to stand on. And uh, so I know that any type of trend, any time you go over the line of your ethics, you're, you're actually, you're not just stealing an item, you're, you're, you're adding weight, you're carrying a burden on your consciousness that is no good. And that burden is much heavier than any possible possession you can get. And so there's really nothing I would, I would loot for. Not that, that that's not a good answer because that doesn't address the ethics. Well, it does a little bit, but there's nothing I want. And I'm actually perfectly, she's gonna disagree with me on this. I'm actually perfectly happy to die today rather than want anything so bad that I would need to loot for it. But what if, what if though we had nothing and we needed to get food for our children? What would, what would we do? And let's say there was a store, the window was already broken and there's no. a, a box of strawberries um, right there and we needed to, and, and our, all five of our kids were starving and they were babies, say. I would go ask somebody for, I mean, if I couldn't go to work, if I couldn't, I don't know, I would go ask somebody. Yeah, and look, there's a history in America of people pulling up by their, literally their bootstraps and doing that. So there is nothing I would loot. And I don't even know how I would do it. There's, there's, you know, there's no, there's no good way to do it. So I'm gonna go on to the next question. Oh. <laughs> Dust, are you okay? I feel so uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, what do I think about Ray Dalio's thoughts on ch positive magic scientist? Uh, uh, well, I'll start with this one. Positive magic scientist, can bolo wraps be dangerous? So. Uh, positive magic scientists. I, I brought up earlier that I've started a law enforcement company in, in a few years ago, and we make a device that r shoots out a uh, s steel cable at the speed of sound and wraps really tightly around you, and and it's almost like mobile handcuffs. And so the question is, could it be dangerous? No. If you go on my Instagram or even I think my TikTok or Facebook, if you go on my Instagram you could see me being wrapped and it doesn't hurt at all. It's a little scary because there's a loud sound. Uh, because they wrap me too. They wrap you too. And they, they make that loud sound on purpose because they want people to be a little scared. scared. It, yeah. I, I've been wrapped over and over, it does not hurt. Yeah. Okay. What if someone was standing right here and shot me in the face? Yes, I would be hurt, but I wouldn't die. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's very, and it, it comes with a laser so you know right. where you're shooting. Exactly. It's hard to misfire it and the right. aim is incredibly accurate and you're not allowed to shoot unless they're within 21 feet, so you can't shoot someone where the aim might not be as good. Uh, in fact, the goal is they want people to run away from them because then they can call for backup and the pe people, you know, people get caught. Unfortunately, it's not something you can use in a big crowd. No. You know, like something like this. Right, no, you have to. It's gotta be, yeah. You can't but it's a good way to not have to physically touch someone right. while you're handcuffing them. And yes. that would have, for instance, not that that would have solved the racism, but it would have, George Floyd would still be alive yeah. if that police officer had had a bowler wrap because yeah. he would have been wrapped right. from 20 feet away right. instead of handcuffed. And that was, so okay, positive magic scientist. Um, what do you think about Ray Dalio's thoughts on China as a rising power that will lead to a new world reserve currency? I'll answer first, but then I know you'll have an opinion. China completely, 100% depends on the US. The Chinese economy is about to go through a shitstorm because every industry in the US just realized that they were dependent on China for all of their manufacturing, for all their supply chain. So if you wanna invest, start investing in um, India, Mexico, Malaysia, even the US. There's gonna be factories that start outside of China and they, you can't call their currency 
a reserve currency because their currency is 100% pegged to the US dollar. That's why China lends the US so much money because they are trying to keep the US dollar from inflating. That's why the US has not had inflation the past few years, even though we have full employment, which usually leads to inflation. There's been no inflation in the US. In fact, now there's deflation because the Chinese are buying so much of our debt. So what do you think? Will well, they ever be a world power? Well, but they also, um, they devalue their currency. That's illegal. You can't do that. Well, it's they legal do. for them. Well, they're, they're not playing the same game that everyone else is, you know, in the world. And that's yeah. not right. But you know what? It's a but free they market. They do that with everything. It's a free market. Let yeah, well, them do you don't that. have to play. You don't have to play with them then. Right. Well, so here's the problem. So. They devalue their currency. Everybody did play with them. They gave everybody, they got this virus that came out of China. Now they're saying it came out of the US, but of course it came out of China. And uh, the free markets are speaking now that, oh my gosh, our entire supply chain depended on China. We made a big mistake. So China's gonna have its own issues. I would not bet on China or any other country. This is also why, why US is gonna stay the most prosperous country. There is no other country the EU is going to have problems bailing out a lot of the economies that were affected by coronavirus, Italy, Spain, Greece. Uh, so there's no other reserve currency. The Soviet, uh, the, Russia is not a reserve currency. Putin's completely corrupt. Uh, where else would you go? South Korea is dependent on us and China. Japan as well. Taiwan. Taiwan's not even recognized as a country by the U.S. I know. Well, so, no, it is, but not with China, though. Um. So, uh, I think, what, is, what time What's is it? What's wrong with just making it here in the U.S.? Nothing. That's where it is, no. the world's reserve well, we currency. Just, but now there's so much chaos. No, I mean, making things. Like, like the supply chain coming from here. I mean, I think we should do more things here. Uh, so, um, Robert San Louis. So, so, a lot of these questions are about the protests. And I understand this. Everyone's nervous. So, Robert San Luis saying, what about the police officers that have been killed? Like, you see this guy in St. Louis was killed. A lot of police officers are being attacked. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that is being done by these more violent elements in the protest. That's what I'm hearing. And so, again, I do think the undercover officers that are now infiltrated into every single protest around the country, they're letting the peaceful protesters do their thing, but they are acting against the groups that are trying to cause violence. So, have faith that that effort will continue, and that's what will lead to the end of these protests. As long as we have world leaders and U.S. leaders on a local and federal level mm -hmm. that acknowledge the for reforms that need to happen. You have to acknowledge that peaceful protests mm -hmm. are having a strong message, but you have to separate it out. And I, we even tell our kids this. It's, it's not loot The looting is not good. Some people think the looting is part of the protesting. It's not. The looting is not good. The rioting is not good. The violent attacks on others are really not good. Twitter is not good for putting all these snuff films out there for our yeah. kids to watch all day long. It's horrible. Um, before we come to an end, I do wanna um, say that tomorrow I'm gonna talk about, uh, or we'll, we'll, we'll both talk about, you know, more business trends, side hustle trends, investment trends. A lot of people are asking, why is the stock market going up <laughs> when, when this shit show it's is so happening? Disconnected. Yeah, it is disconnected. I'll give a mini answer right now, which is that the stock market is always disconnected from the economy. And, you know, I've, I've answered this a little bit before, but the problem is a lot of small stores that aren't stocks are going out of business, but the stocks that are, the companies that are surviving are the bigger, better finance companies like Starbucks mm -hmm. or Amazon that are huge, that are stocks. So there's this disconnect now between the economy and the Starbucks of the world. The little mom and pop cafes are going out of business and that's sad and the Starbucks are gaining market share as a result. So their stock is going up. So the stock market goes up. That's part of the answer. Part of the answer is because what I said earlier, there's still innovation happening. There's still profits being made. Did you see Zoom's earnings yesterday? Zoom, they thought it was gonna have 200 million in revenues. They had like almost 400 million in revenues. So there are companies that are flourishing. Marijuana companies are flourishing. Amazon, flourishing. Walmart, flourishing. Target, flourishing, except for the stores that have been destroyed. So, you know, again, that's a disconnect, but 
there's opportunities for everybody. I I will uh, uh, will cover some of those tomorrow. What what day is tomorrow? Friday. I yeah, tomorrow's Friday. Right. So tomorrow we'll do a focus a little bit more on side hustles, investment opportunities, economic opportunities, educational opportunities. Uh, I, I hope. Um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm really grateful for everybody who's been tuning in to these and, and listening. We've been, we, I'll save this on IGTV. I'll save this on YouTube. It'll also be in a podcast next week. And, uh, uh, you know, again, tomorrow we'll talk about more side hustles and how you can get involved in them. I, I'm pretty sure, I know for a fact, not only can you make a living, but you can make a multi-million dollar business just starting from side hustles. I almost don't like call them side hustles because they're not on the side anymore. They're what we should be doing. It's, I tell my kids, mm -hmm. they're what you should be doing, not doing on the side, but doing in the center. So that's tomorrow. And today though, we just wanted to give some thoughts of, and, and, and reasons why you can count on long-term safety, even in this crazy situation you're in. We're all in, we're all in it together. We're all surviving. We're all, we're all gonna have stories to tell our grandchildren and they're gonna be amazed. And, you know, good luck till tomorrow and see you at 2 p.m. tomorrow. I'm gonna say this on IGTV. And so, uh, Jay, Alien Room, let's get their question and that'll be first for tomorrow. Uh, thanks so much, everybody. Yeah. Bye.